right. Good evening, folks, and welcome to FMA Discussion. This is episode 455, and today we're going to be talking to Alberto Perez, and we're going to be talking about a couple different things. One, say his background, FMA, <clears throat> and what he's doing now. Also, we're going to be looking at the history of 52 blocks, as he's aware of it. He's going to share that with us. Also, we'll be looking at knife culture in general and razor blades and stuff, good stuff like that. So if you're watching, tell us where you're watching from. Smash that like button. If you have questions, please put them in the right-hand side, and I'll be sure to get them to him so he can answer them. And without further ado, here he is. Good evening, Dean. How are you? Hey there. How are you? Good. Not bad. Running around a little bit, but uh, everything's good. All right. So, yeah. Uh, interesting test run, I thought. Um, just adjusting my camera here. But, uh, yeah. So, you've kind of been around the block, done a bunch of different stuff. So, uh, just for folks who are watching, uh, why don't you give us, I guess, martial arts background before we, and then kind of um, we can go into the FMA aspect of it. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. I started my martial arts training when I was 13 years old in 1981, the summer of 1981. Um, my father put me in a Taekwondo hot keto school in Queens, New York. Um, the teacher there, his name was uh, Grandmaster Ponky Kim. Uh, I think at that time he might have been maybe an eighth or ninth Don. Uh, oh, he was also a Northern Shaolin stylist because in the old Wells World's Fair, I think it was in 64, 65, he did demos. So um, I was there for a little while, not long, because I was 13. I was still in parochial boarding school in upstate in Orange County. So I just did it for the summer. And then I didn't go back into training in martial arts again until about uh, 1984. And that's when I started in judo in high school and uh, Kaioka Shinkai Karate, Masuyama's Karate, which uh, Shigoro Oyama had in school down in um, the village on Avenue of the Americas by West 4th Street. So between those two systems... I trained periodically maybe six months. Uh, I did some boxing at the boys club in uh, Richmond Hill, Queens. And then um, after 85, I didn't train uh, until maybe 1993. Mm -hmm. I got back into the martial arts. I was about 25 when I got back into it. Uh, I, I went to the New York Aikikai you know, on 18th Street in Manhattan. And I went to the late um, Yama, uh, Sensei Yamada School at the Aikikai on 18th Street. And I was there maybe for about a month or so, but it wasn't aggressive enough for me, especially for the streets of New York at that time. This mm -hmm. is now 92. Okay. Then, uh, I was a student at that time. I was going to a vocational school on 14th Street, and I happened to come by a, a school that I saw, I guess, the phone number in the yellow pages or a flyer called the U.S. <laughs> Budu Kai Khan. And it was ran by the late Chief Grandmaster Rico Guy. Uh, he was a goju stylist. He was a Japanese stylist and he was high ranking in uh, Iaido, Kendo, Judo, Jiu Jitsu, and uh, Shrinji Kempo. So I stopped by the school um, and we did the morning classes on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 7 30 to 9. So I said, okay, this is where I want to be at. So I trained with Rico Guy for about two years in combat judo and uh, Kempo. Yeah, he kind of <clears throat> created his own system. It was hybrid, eclectic. He combined uh, Goju with uh, the Shrinji Kempo uh, techniques. And so he taught us traditional, but he also taught us combative uh, for the mm -hmm. street. Uh, I was with him for about two years. And then after 95, uh, 96, I left New York. I went down south for about almost eight years, came back. And then between 02 and 07, um, I hadn't trained in 12 years, between 95 and 2007. 2007, there was an incident that happened, which woke me up to the realization of how dangerous and how scary edge weapons can be, especially when one is pulled out on you, <laughs> a straight edge razor. So I said, you know what? I got to get back into this, man. So I started training in blade and blade uh, culture or blade tactics with my um, with this guy by the name of Latif Dickerson out of Jersey City, New Jersey. He ran his own firearm school. Uh, he was a former CO in Hudson County Jail. He was a paramedic for about six months. Mm -hmm. And um, so his blade system consisted of what he learned from Don Cuesta. Out Don of Cuesta. Cuesta, yeah. yeah. Jose Pares. That's right. He trained with him and two of the late Professor Florendo Visitacions, or three of Professor Florendo Visitacions. Yeah, okay. 
which was Michelle Pierre, Sensei Corey, and David James. Okay. So he took from that what he learned from them in the uh, jiu-jitsu and put together his own blade system called Kinetics. So, um, you know, he had his own angles and templates, but a lot of his was, was, it was combative and very realistic the way we trained. And he had cross-trained and went to like Hank Hayes seminars out in California when Hank Hayes was out there of No Lies Blade. He cross-trained with different people. So with him, I got certified in just the basics uh, of uh, uh, pistol, rifle, and shotgun, because he has four levels of each. Mm -hmm. Then I did a bunch of classes with him, first aid, CPR, uh, use of force, a whole bunch of stuff. Then two years with him, uh, in between that time, in 08, I started to train in the contemporary JKD under Sensei Richard Garcia in East Harlem. And he was an instructor on the Paul Vunak. So between him, another guy named Chris Moran was a senior full instructor. And Chris Moran, another, know that name. Yeah, yeah Chris Moran, right. Uh, Barry, uh, I don't know if you heard of Barry Edwinick. They called him Kuda. He was definitely Chris Moran. I know he was definitely up there. I mean, uh, Vunak is my JKD in lineage as well. And uh, but I know Chris Moran was definitely up there. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, this other guy that trained with Vunak between 87 and 95 named Barry. He uh, What he did was he took everything he learned from Vunak and the seminars that uh, he would go to on, under Dada and Santo mm -hmm. and Richard Bustillo. And he combined his own system, which was strictly blade. It was called um, Blade Smart. So Blade Smart. I, Blade Smart. So I trained with those guys, right, between 2008 and uh, about 2011. But in between that, uh, I went to Newbreed Martial Arts Academy in Whitestone, Queens, under mm -hmm. Luigi Pellar and Alex Chan. And I started training in the uh, Inasano curriculum, which would be, you know, the Jun Fan Gung Fu, yeah. uh, Inasano Kali uh, Lacoste system, and as well as um, uh, Wing Chun, which was under the Francis, it's under the Francis Fan Association. Mm -hmm. So I was with those guys for a couple of years. And in between that and searching, I really got more into the FMA stuff. So then um, I cross-trained uh, with uh, Steve Sachs and Dog Brothers Martial Arts, um, Jeff Chung on the Neo Tribe Kali out of Queens. Jeff Chung, um, ex sayak guy. We were both in Sayak together, yeah. Yeah, Jeff Chung, I trained with Jeff for about eight months. Yeah. Uh, I trained with uh, Frank Ortega, who was one of uh, Grand Tour Leo Guy's original students. Yeah. I cross trained with Spencer G. Pananandata. Spencer G. Yeah. Right. Spencer G, man. Mm. I trained with him. I uh, was going to a bunch of seminars. And then I got into Bikini Tertiary around 2016 when I did a seminar up in White Plains with uh, AK Baraka, who hosted it, and Michael Franciotti. So, me and Leo, we, I helped him do a demo uh, seminar down in Mexico City because we wanted to bring Bikini <laughs> into Mexico and spread it through Latin America. Mm. I was down there for about two weeks. I did personal training with Leo, and uh, then the last time I saw Leo was 2018. That was the last time I, seminar I went to out in um, New Jersey, Blue Life Karate under Duran Howard. And Duran Howard, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right, Duran Howard. And then um, pretty much after that, I, I haven't seen Leo in years. You know, we, we communicate from time to time through Facebook Messenger, and there's a group in Latin America, in Argentina, uh, under the name of Katipo Nan, uh, which is under Mick Alcaraz and Jay Baraclan, who's one of Leo's top guys on the Philippines. That's right, yeah, Mick, yeah. So Fernando Pereira is actually the Tujon down in Argentina. And uh, so it's spreading Piquiti. It's now pretty much where you got some guys on the Tim Way, then you got some guys on Leo Gaje. So it's like in Chile, Argentina, Ecuador, mm -hmm. so I think Peru also as well, you know. So then um, basically uh, I cross-trained in those systems for a while. I got into Muay Thai just to get in shape. You know, I did it for about six months on uh, <laughs> my knees, you know, because I got the arthritis, so I had to, I had to stop. So right now I'm kind of like, uh, I still do FMA, but at home or, you know, on Zoom or with the group. And uh, but now I'm just doing like, the, I went back into Wing Chun and I'm doing the uh, Irish stick fighting under the Doyle system here in New York City. Bernie. Once <laughs> yeah, so that's pretty much my background in those. Uh, oh, in 52 Blocks, um, I cross-trained with uh, Daniel Marks. I started with him in 07 to about 09, I think. For that name. Okay. Yeah, 52 Blocks, 52 Constellation. I trained with him. I trained with another gentleman who was old school from Brooklyn. He was a boxer, but he was also an uh, ex-felon. He was in and out of the system for many years. His name was uh, Arthur Mack. He passed away about two years ago. And then one of his students. So those are the only guys that I kind of like cross-trained with. 
and 52 blocks and i was just kind of like basically just learning the basics you know what i mean of, of, of the system but i never really went really like advanced advanced mm -hmm. because guys that were like the old timers a lot of them have passed away and if some of them are still alive that you know they don't even they don't even do it no more yeah yeah wow what that's yeah you want to talk about eclectic background you got wow you went from like heavy japanese background into <clears throat> you know <laughs> straight on knife and <laughs> and then uh but i've heard a new breed that yeah like um the asano blend there but i'm just gonna catch up let me just oh we got some folks saying hi all right we got oh we got guru j we got ryan you know that ryan guy right? sure so sure, of course that's my boy he's nothing but, he's nothing but a troublemaker but no. uh, <laughs> we got andres new jersey gm ron we got tony we got maynard california norman uh storming norman and we got ua from germany all right so um i guess my first question to you i mean like that's you know like many of us we started out traditional arts mm -hmm. like mine was taekwondo and then of course seeing the first ufc <clears throat> i was really going out for an mma but really found my true passion which was uh fma uh in there but uh it seems like many of us have kind of gone that route you know what i mean we, we started out traditional and then eventually found ourselves you know our true passion and uh, being that you know fma or other arts you know such as that jkd so i guess my question to you is when you went from that background of japanese martial arts and traditional weapons and what have you more form oriented kata you know, depending on what you're doing and that what was like the most biggest difference that you experienced as far as then going into like the weapons i mean before you went to fma you were doing some you know you were doing knife specifically you know so what what stood out i guess I didn't start learning knife uh, combative tactics until I met Latif in uh, 2007. Actually, in 05 was the first time I spoke to him over the phone. So being that uh, he had a background in Freemasonry, and I did too, um, a while back, we were able to connect. And so um, I called him one day, and um, I went out there to Jersey City. And I was about 39, almost 40. That's when I started really getting back into mm -hmm. it, because I like the last 16 years, you know what I mean? I'm 55 now, going on 56. So he kind of like opened up my eyes to that because prior to that, pretty much in the Japanese systems, it was basically all empty hand. We knew it was Kempo, yeah, yeah. uh, Karate. Okay. So, I mean, like, so, I mean, you're jumping like, you know, right into the, you know, so how were those systems, um, like, what was, I guess, for folks that maybe don't know, including myself, like how was the curriculum designed or set up? Was it interactive? Was it dr mostly drills? I mean, you know, what was the approach? With the Japanese systems? No, no, with the, uh, when you segue into the uh, knife arts there, pre-FMA, the guys that you were working with. Yeah, it was, uh, we had a uniformity, but it wasn't, you know, we did drills, but we mostly did, um, how could I say? I mean, you know, um, we trained with the uh, spiderco trainers. That was a particular blade that we carried, and so uh, it was big back then. Yeah, yeah spiderco definitely. Yeah. And so we um, we did a lot of um, uh, real life scenarios. Mm. You know, people call reality training, and also like you know we put on the white shirt and the training knife with the lipstick, and then we go at it. You know what I mean? And we'll, you know wherever you got marked up at, that's where you would cut. But it wasn't like. Um, a traditional FMA school where there's a lot of drills, there's a lot of uh, counters and recounters, a lot of uh, you know uh, strips, disarms, mm. things out of that nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I know what you mean. So, I mean, so that sounds exciting, and that's kind of the approach I take with my guy. It's like I don't use the markers in my T-shirts anymore. Um, I mean, I could. I just yeah. haven't decided not yet yeah, to do that, but definitely so when you talk about the scenarios and all that are you like was it a how was the empty hand approach to knife what, did you guys go into that like the more common tax your sewing machines or reverse grip and, for, yeah. and okay reverse grip slashes thrust you know uh, empty hand disarms 
Um, because I know realistically, you know, with disarms, I would never try to go empty hand against the person with a knife. That's why I always carry a knife on me. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So, and Leo used to say, carry three. So you got one <laughs> person that's coming after you and two for his back up to the back up to the back up. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, how can I explain it to you? Um, the empty hand towards the knife. Um, it was like in situational scenarios, like you'd be pinned up against a wall, mm -hmm. a knife throw, or being attacked by behind. Or a person coming at you, you know what I'm saying, to slash you like in that X pattern or thrust, mm -hmm. or open, which is your typical attacks with a bladed edge weapon. Because it's it's been a while since I trained with him. And so, you know, I flowed from one system to another. But it wasn't some it, it, it was whatever worked, whether he was on the ground, standing up, sitting down, whatever the case was. So I remember one time he bought the uh Blower suit for about seven hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. You know. So we would go full blast on him, man. He'd have the helmet on, the the suit and everything like that and um so he had what they call templates or what they called um landmarks where okay. they were like 12 different landmarks where you, you know you would cut you know like a template yeah somewhat similar to the psyop but not exactly template yeah three of nine four twelve yeah etc cetera, etc cetera. um <clears throat> remember those days but uh and so all right after that then you kind of uh FMA and was so was Steve Sachs your first intro or was it New Breed that was first as far as FMA is concerned? Uh, I want to say I want to say New Breed. New Breed and so Anasano that's where I started with my first FMA exposure was the Anasano blend. Um, so you know, um, thankful for it. It led me to discover other FMA systems and you know, kind of branch out in that. So, what were your thoughts on the Anasano blend and your experience? You know, it was good. You know, I went as far as intermediate level. Um, you know, I learned the typical disarm strips, quick releases. You know, uh, tapping system, knife tapping systems. Um, because the Nilsano Lacoste blend, I think, is like a combination of like 20 different systems. So you have a little bit of Sarada in there, Piquiti Tertia, yeah. So it was just a lot of drills, counter for counter, Sumbrada, Numerada, um, Espada Daga, you know, single Daga, solo, uh, double Daga. Mm -hmm. And but like I said before, with the empty hand against the knife, uh, and I can quote Vunak, he said, it's something very, very difficult. I mean, it's like, it's like trapping. You don't look for it. It's either incidental or accidental. You yeah, know, yeah. like I was telling you yesterday, like if a person pulls out a knife on me and I can run, I'm going to run. I'm not going to stay there and try to, you know what I mean? Slice and dice. Yeah, yeah. To... absolutely. When, yeah, when the option's there, for sure. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, the Anasano blend, it's, it's a lot in there, you know what I mean? And depending on the decade, what was featured, you know what I mean? Uh, obviously, PTK is yeah. a huge, a vast amount of material in there. Kabbalah's, her own system. I mean, there's, yeah. So it's, uh, but again, it was, I'm thankful for it because it kind of mm -hmm. got me into it deeply and, and, the willingness to venture out, but my again, I credit my initial exposure to FMA definitely to the Anasano blend in in, a, in there. So uh, yeah, I, th I, mean, I think out of all the systems, Dean, that uh, when it comes to the knife, that I could say was probably the most realistic uh, in terms of what you can confront in the street was with uh, Latif Dickerson in uh, no. Uh, no, I'm sorry, that's Hank Hayes, a kinetics knife, and. Uh, Training with Barry Kuda, Yedwinik, and uh, Blade Smart. To me, those yeah. are the most two, two realistic uh, knife systems. Yeah, yeah, they probably just dove deeply into that and created and scenarios. And yeah, um, yeah, that's an area you want to go deep into. I, you know, I highly suggest you you seek out guys who have really have made that area your their major. You know what I mean? Not not so much like a system that does everything but i think in my opinion in my experience you really need to seek out people that just really dove in that deep and not just from you know uh you know hostage situation where it's on you but moving clinch work it's on the ground you know anything short of that yeah i know you know, he was a correction officer in indiana for about two or three years so he saw firsthand just like latif he was a correction officer for like mm -hmm. 
So these are the kind of guys. And then even like Ray Rosario, he trained under Frank Ortega. He was a Miami Rouge Jiu-Jitsu guy. And uh, he was a, a correction officer on Rikers Island for like 20 years. And like I told you, I asked him one time, of all the experiences you had in there, you know, being in the riot team and training them and all of that and being in riots and inmates coming at you, you know, were you, how many times did you use the Kali system? He said all the time. And like he, I explained to you, he said they're going to come at you in that X pattern and mm. thrust overhead. That's how that's how they're going to come at yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, which is, uh, yeah, it's going to be Y slashes. It's yeah. going to be so machine or it's going to be there. So Eric O'Brien, you're watching uh, what's level one material from Blade Tech. I get this right, Eric. Uh, we got some new folks saying hi. We got Norman. New Breed is a great school. Yeah, I've heard good things about mm -hmm. it. That's cool. Sure. Yeah, That's we got cool. Kirk from Alaska. Oh, we got Dr. Tim. And we got Pepito Gonzalez. Hey there. And Eric Ocross, who I just mentioned. And uh, so, folks, yes, if you have questions, please let me know. Um, all right. So, Steve Sachs. Um, <clears throat> so, from New Breed, that's this is funny. You went from New Breed to Steve Sachs, man. That is night and day, man. That you know, is... I thought about Steve in the group through um, Stick Grappler, the guy that writes that yeah. used to write the column. Yeah. And, uh, we chatted, and he told me that, that Steve was starting a group here in New York City. This was like around November, December of 2015. This yeah. is right before I took a two-week vacation, and I did a class with him before. I did a class with him before I went to the Dominican Republic, and um, Steve said, hey, when you come back, man, you know, and, and I really liked it, man, you know. Steve, at that time, he was like a group leader. Yeah, uh, yeah the group, okay, yeah. But he came up in the ranks. I think the last ranking that I got from him was Orange Tag, and uh, I was with Steve for about three years. You know, the group met like mm -hmm. once once a week, I'm sorry, once a week, we're training outside in the parks and different locations that we would rent out. And uh, yeah. he was the one really that opened up my eyes for like full contact stick fighting. You know what I mean? Like that yeah, was- He'll do it. Yeah. He'll definitely open those eyes. Yeah. <laughs> he's, uh, I mean, obviously, as you know, he's, I mean, he's leading New York dog, but his full dog. I mean, he's, oh, he's he, I got to honestly say, yeah. like I fought a few of those guys, um, my opinion. He's probably one of the more scary ones, Steve. No, he's listen. I've trained with him with Steve one on one, man. I've sparred with him, and uh, you know I have a lot of high regards for him, a lot of respect for him, and uh, you know eventually, I guess when you know when the weather gets better, and hopefully my knees will get a little better, I like to you know start training with him again. You know what I mean? Because I really like training with him, man. It, it just keeps you going. The footwork, I mean, just everything, and it, it was just so much that we shared all together in the group. That yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. He's, others, yeah, yeah. He's uh, yeah, he's the guy to see it, and especially in your area, <clears throat> in my opinion, you know. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, and uh, so, um, let's jump into, um, I guess, you know, that far as you understand the history of 52, uh, you know, I find it it's really interesting and fascinating, uh, especially from, I guess. Well, you, um, as far as your exposure, I guess, to some of the, the old timers, you know what I mean? And and so I'm guessing, like, you've had some great conversations with them? Yeah. Um, when I first heard of it, Dean, it was in 1979. 79? Wow, okay. And that's when I first heard of it. And uh, I was in boarding school. I was in uh, military school up in Harriman, New York, for about three years. So there was a lot of guys there that were from the Brooklyn area. They were from like Brownsville, Bedford Stuyvesant, Fort Greene. So these guys would talk about it and they would demonstrate some of the moves and everything because, you know, you have some people that act like they can do it or think they know it or emulate it. And then you got guys that can really do it and really put, pull it off in real mm -hmm. time. So as a kid, it was like, okay, Jailhouse Rock 52. Wow. You know, hip hop era was coming up and 52. Mm -hmm associated with the uh five percent nation which was an offshoot of the nation of islam and it was mostly a brooklyn thing queens too a lot of guys from south jamaica queens knew it and there were legends out there in the street that years later when i started doing research on my own which was in 07 um you know you hear you hear names like divine knowledge saladin glass man penguin joker red uh eric tweedy these guys were like dangerous with it they can really 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 do it 
Uh, the only old timer that I touched hands with before he died was Arthur uh, Mac. He would call himself Fleetwood Mac, like the Cadillac. And oh. he was. <laughs> yeah. and this guy, he wrote books, uh, poetry. He's got a couple of patent inventions that he put out there. Uh, awesome. Okay. All right. Hey, but his health, man. Yeah, his health was bad. You know what I mean? He smoked a lot of cigarettes and then eventually caught up. Um, yeah, so he passed away like two years ago. And I touched with, you know, hands with him twice. And I'll tell you, he told me, I, I did a moving job from him from New Jersey to Fort Worth, Texas. It took us like two days. Yeah. When we got down there, we were talking. And he said, no, we was in a gas station. We pulled up. He said, touch my outer thigh. Just just put your finger on it. And that thing was like a solid, solid concrete post. That's how solid his legs were. And his 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 fists were like iron, like like a mallet, you know, like a sledgehammer, man. And mm -hmm. he was already in the 50s. And, uh, you know, he told me certain stories, you know, coming up. So when I started to investigate about 52 blocks, uh, it was in 07, I went in the internet. I was like, wow, you know, you got a couple guys here in New York doing it, teaching it. Uh, you had like Light Burley, uh, Daniel Marks. And, uh, but then there was a lot of friction between the different camps, you know, a lot of ego. Mm -hmm. Like an FMA, you got a lot of ego. Oh, yeah, I know. A lot of oh, politics. God. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, I stayed away from all of that. So I did it for about six months with Daniel, like every Sunday for two hours. So I was just learning a lot of the basics, the stances, the punches, the blocks, the deflicks, you know what I mean? The faint. Mm. You know, a lot of, a lot of nice little tricks in the bag that you can pull off, you know, and, you know, faint and fake your opponent and just set them up for something else and then lay them out. Mm. And, uh, but the last person that I touched hands with, uh, I guess it was about five years ago. He was a young guy from uh, Queens. He was uh, actually a saxophonist, a jazz player. His name was Daniel also. We trained a couple of times. And then it, we kind of like separated. So I haven't really crossed training, training in 52 since like 2018 because I was so busy in those years training more in FMA. Excuse me. Yeah. And then Jim right. Fonda, JKD Kickbox, but most, a, lot, a lot of FMA yeah. than, than anything else. So, but you, but it sounds like you enjoy you were enjoying the material, right? I mean, I love all the material, and I still do, you know, and yeah, I still. Yeah. And I always said, Dean, that to me, the toughest and roughest guys, man, were the uh, combative soldiers that came back from Vietnam. Um, some of these guys I met as a teenager in, in the eighties in the street that used to give me a lot of counseling and advice. They were probably like ex special forces, Rangers, Force Recon. Mm. Uh, all they knew was combatives. It was just how to neutralize and take the enemy out. That's it. And then um, the guys that were in the penal system and from the street, I always said these were the the, if you, if the best martial artists would be those guys because those guys have the experience. They have the evidence, the reason. They have the intent. You know, it, it, it's just there, man. Which kind of segues, we can kind of jump into it now. It's like uh, systems, what I kind of call systems irrelevance. Um and meaning that, like, let's go back to knife, for instance. Mm -hmm. you know I mean, like, you know, we were we touched upon this in a test run. And it's like where are attacks going on as right now as me and you are speaking. Sure. It's probably Latin America, South yeah. Africa, oh, yeah. which has the most per pop, you know, per population ratio, Absolutely. incredible amount of attacks. And any prison system, you know, throughout the world, you know what I mean? And and that so um so i chose to really look at those because i you know like you know when they get released okay well, what happens in there well a when they get released that information gets shared perpetuated and all that so it's not like you know it can't happen i mean the, yeah of course the likelihood depending on where you live you know obviously in that but still I still want to be relevant to right. what I give my students and, well, and there. So I think it's important if you're teaching knife work and all that, like, are you up to speed? Are you up to date to like what's going on? Do you know what I mean? Sure. As, you know? And so, yeah, that's yeah. my spiel. <laughs> Eric, I was uh, telling you, if you, you know, and I know you've watched plenty of those videos, uh, whether it's the Philippines or the Dominican Republic or uh, Puerto Rico or whatever, it's like, you're not going to see what we learned in FMA. You're not going to see that. Mm -hmm. no, and I told you about that video that Mark Denny had put in his first Die Less Often video series. But I study it and I, I, I study all of these, all of these videos, all of these different teachers. I, I, I study and read them all. Mm -hmm. And they showed a guy that was trying to assassinate uh, the late um, 
Ferdinand Marcos' wife. Who was, hey, you're uh, telling me. Emilio yeah. Marcos, yeah. He just came up and right out of his suit jacket, he pulled out a kitchen knife and started stabbing him. You know, it was just like overhand. Yeah, nothing, okay. you know. You know, fancy. Yeah, just, yeah, right, exactly. Gross motor. Gross motor. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Meyer. Michael Meyer is Jason Chuck. Yeah. <laughs> Psycho shower scene, right? Exactly. Yeah. There you go, man. That's why I think most of us were first exposed to that from yeah. a, I guess, a uh, theatrical. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. But uh, but nonetheless, though, yeah, incredibly relevant and uh, what's going on. Yeah, it's just, um, I know. So, and it's not that, I mean, I love FMA and all that, but it's, doesn't mean it's the most relevant when we're viewing the lens of knife attacks you know what i mean and how to defend against those and you know what is your methodology based on the evidence that's out there and um so that's kind of my issue you know what i mean but again that's not to say fma doesn't have value you know that i would be a hypocrite to say that you know what i mean so i just think we need to look elsewhere yeah. as well you know I guess. I, I, uh, believe it or not, Dean, uh, I'm interested in even learning your blade tech system, man. I, I'd like to definitely participate and learn from uh, your system. So, yeah, Ryan likes it. Eric O'Brien is here. But, you know, much to the point, um, I, you know, I don't like going, you know, and like, hey, you know, you should join my system. Matter of fact, I leave my system, generally speaking, at an interview. It's just so I don't come, you know what I mean? Kind of keep them separate. Yeah. But, um, but where I will say about blade tech is that all the all this i was just speaking on you know what i mean that's what i put into blade tech you mm -hmm. know what i mean so in that um yes there's absolutely fma in blade tech however yeah. though a good chunk of it is these other systems yes. of influence and stuff absolutely you know? yeah absolutely. Um, so um okay you were and um so with regard so how what do you think these old timers with regards to the 52 do you think like what you're seeing today um and we'll get to ken shadow but like have you seen it going down like has it gotten watered down if that's even appropriate I, i'm and i'm not even saying it has i'm just asking you like from the old timers and the way they were about their craft i think one of the the guys that i've seen now where it's not watered down is teaching it and it has experience with it, back it up. And from the old school would be somebody like Ken, like Shadow. He's definitely, definitely, he's he's carrying the lineage. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. And I've heard nothing but, I mean, yeah, that's, which is why I sought him out um, in there. Definitely. Because he seemed yeah, I, pretty legit. Yeah. yeah <laughs> legit. Oh, there's no question about it. You know, he's got a system. He's a nice person. Me and him, we had a long chat about a year or so ago. I think yeah. he had York. I was supposed to hook up with him, man, but it just it just didn't happen because he's all the way up in uh, Binghamton. But yeah, I seems, seems his you know, uh, his quote is he's three and three three something hours away from everybody. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, yeah. I want to say from the old school, there's really not too many left. Uh, guys, is the guys that are people that are emulating it. That to me is just watered down, and. Uh, there was a difference. There was a difference that a gentleman that I know who has a school in East Orange, New Jersey, who is a boxer and a Shotokan stylist. His name is Saif Carmen, and I I think I sent uh, you the videos of him doing what they call Jailhouse Rock, which mm. is fifty two, because of the slipping, the bobbing, the weaving. You know what I mean? And just straight up, uh, just just straight up boxing. But the slips, the bobs, the weaves, the feints, the fakes. There's not a lot of the. Um, a lot of the hand motions that you know 52 blocks does so you, you know he would kind of like explaining how the difference was when he was coming up how it was called yeah. jailhouse instead of 52 and i had heard both terms 52 blocks and jailhouse rock going back to like 79 80 81 and uh but like somebody like himself like say of carmen um ken you know those guys are legit if, if i was to ever learn and get back into it it would be either from one of those two guys and this thing you know, the whole thing with the hand and all that like you know that dis that distraction piece um yeah. you know what ken refers to as stacking the deck shuffling the deck um to me that is that's paramount 
like if you can distract somebody i mean to me that's um in there and uh i mean i, I guess like anything I, it's sad to see regardless of the art there where there is some watering down going on but i think it's unfortunately i think it's inevitable i don't know um well, if jailhouse rock or 52 blocks the first time it was mentioned in the periodical here in the united states was in black belt magazine in 1970 mm. the issue called karate in prison and in there, they had a picture of uh, Miguel Pinero. Miguel Pinero was a poet. You know, he was Puerto Rican descent from the Low East Side of Manhattan. And he used to roll with a gang called the Dynamite Brothers. He was in a movie called Short Eyes, which goes back mm. to like the 70s. It was filmed in the uh, the tombs of Manhattan uh, Detention Center in, in, in New York City. Long I heard about the tombs. It's like right. legendary. <laughs> he was Apache of the Bronx. He was in an episode of Kojak. Port Apache too, man. Yeah. He was one of the founders of the uh, New York Ricans Poets Cafe in the Low East Side. Okay. Uh, died of cirrhosis of the liver in '88, but he was in a position in the, mo in, the in the magazine in the Woodburn shuffle position because you had different different styles in the prison system. You had the Elmira style from Elmira Correctional Facility, which they called the Pretty Boy. You had the Comstock Fifty Two, which was fighting off of the wall when you're fighting three individuals or more. And you had the Woodburn shuffle where they where they specialize in a particular footwork. And so then later, on, uh, Maestre um, Dennis Newsom was in a book called Martial Arts from Around the World, which came out in the 90s, uh, Burbank, mm -hmm. California, unique uh, publications. And they have pictures of him demonstrating jailhouse rock. Now, Dennis will not, he's, he teaches privately only to certain students. He won't even teach anybody outside of African-American race, because he told me that. Uh, because of what he learned, he didn't want it to seep out there and then get in the wrong hands or somebody pervert it or water it down and then claim it later on. Which I could understand because the Chinese. Yeah, were yeah, I can understand. I can understand that. Yeah. I don't think that is racist and all that. He's trying to preserve something, the authenticity of it. Um, right. I can. I get it. You know what? In the first Lethal Weapon with Mel Gibson, because even Gary Busey said it, Dennis actually was the fight choreographer and taught Mel Gibson some of the Jailhouse Rock for the movie Lethal Weapon. And then oh, interesting. Gibson had I think it was Hickson or Ryan Gracie that also taught Mel. Yeah, on, on the uh, card where he's choked. Yeah, the uh, at the yeah. end with Gary Busey. And I think there's a little capoeira mix in there. And it might have came from Dennis Newsom. Interesting. But he Interesting. there's if I can find the pictures of Mel Gibson in the different poses. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to forward it to you so you'll see what I'm talking about. Yeah, Dennis I appreciate it. Yeah, I definitely know. I knew of the VJJ influence from them when he, you yeah. know, when he. Uh, is on barring and, and and chokes him out. So I knew that, but I had no idea of the 52 influence. The whole, from my understanding, and I'm I'm not saying I'm right, it's just that the jailhouse rock was the kind of the original term per se, and then 52 a term came after that. Well, according to a documentary that I saw, Who's Who in 52, the late Reno Morales, who was a Marine in Vietnam and uh, Shotokan master, spoke about some of the history and when it goes back to the 50s mm. probably 40s it was called state of or state of the art and so it was a lot of boxing but it was prison boxing it was dirty boxing because it's close mm. quarters. even floyd patterson he did some time upstate in kagsaki and he had learned some of it mike tyson knew because he was from brownsville brooklyn and there's a heavy influence out of brownsville brooklyn in the jailhouse of 52. Mm. Mm -hmm. dad judah another one You'll see it in a fight, the fight he had Floyd Mayweather. You know, he used some of the shielding and and, and, and 52 blocks. And so, but it was uh, from what Reno, late Reno Morales, it was called Stato. But then it goes back even before that with doing slavery, with the Virginia scuffling. Uh, Atlanta had what the, Atlanta has what they call the alto scuffle, uh, knocking and kicking, you know. And these were different techniques of grappling and, and boxing empty hand. Mm. Uh, which kind of like, if, if you look at the grappling aspect of it and the raw brutality in the movie Django, I don't know if you saw Django, it. No, I know. Yeah, the, the one yeah. eye, the whole yeah. thing with the one eye, right? Yeah, yeah, with the Mandingo fighting, how they were prize fighters, but they were really like, it, 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 it was like no holds barred. It was like to the I kill. Know, and nasty <laughs> stuff I heard, man, yeah. for the for people to spectate. I mean, just terrible, yeah. just if terrible. You look at terrible. It, African systems, like coming from the west coast of Africa, like Nigeria, Senegal, mm. they're wrestling, Hausa wrestling, uh, Dambe. Um, there's another system of form of boxing and grappling. I just forgot, I can't remember the name of it right now. But from that region, you'll see how now a lot of the West Africans that are fighting in uh, M MMA in the UFC, they're like excellent, excellent fighters and athletes, man, because they've trained, you know, from over there, 
you know, in Senegalese wrestling. Do you see that stuff, man? Yeah. That, that is freaking. No wonder yeah. why they're conditioned yeah. and ready to go, man. Are you kidding me? Watching yeah, those guys? Yeah, they're coming up in MMA, man. They're, they're it's really, like freaking. No wonder why they're doing so well. Look what they're look at their training. I mean, yeah, they're, yeah. They're, that doesn't surprise me one bit. After seeing some of the vids on that, you know, in the sand and all that, I mean, now yeah. they get on the like an even flat floor. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know what I mean? After playing in sand for God knows how many years, you know what I mean? Yeah. Have you Richardson on your show? Who's that? Burton Richardson. Oh yeah, my uh, probably like three or four times. Oh yeah, oh, as a matter of fact, he's the one. I, I, the video, which I was, I saw from. Yeah, uh, he um, trained in South Africa like three times. I think he went down there to learn. Zulu. He went to yeah. He did a lot of Zulu from yeah the Zulu. Um, he's the only that I know of that's qualified to teach that here in the fifty states because there's nobody else. Um, I know. I, he's I know. definitely qualified. I can't speak on if he's the only one, but if I had to guess. Probably, yeah. Uh, definitely qualified to teach it, authorized to teach it. Got permission over there. I'm just not sure. I don't want to say he like he's the only one, but very well could be though. Yeah, yeah. Because um, um, my first JKD instructor and contemporary JKD and JKD concepts, uh, Richard Garcia, he trained with Nigel February at his house. He was down there for about a month, month and a half, mm. and he trained in you know some of the Piper material. The Piper system. Mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> and, we'll, and I'm just kidding. I, I'm just making sure I'm not missing any questions here. Sometimes I get overly and all right. Let me just hold. Oh, bear with me. Here. All right. Well, okay. Here we go. I did miss a question. Mm. All right. This is from Kurt. What are your thoughts about the representation of 52 blocks in movies? For example, Michael J. White. Um, I didn't see Michael J. White. I did see Lawrence Tate do it in Gun Hill. And because they were trained by this guy out of Chicago. He lives in California. His name is, uh, he wrote a few books. I can't remember his name right now. But, and then I saw it also in one of the Fast and Furious movies that Ludacris, the rapper out of Atlanta, did it. Okay. You know, and they were trained by this guy named Amadou Diallo. Amadou Diallo. He's out there in California uh, and Van Noy on, uh, he teaches out of, um, I forgot the guy's name, Mark Plana. I think his name is, I think his last name is Plana, but he's a Dos Apares guy. And, okay. And uh, Amadou Diallo, he, um, if that's his, you know, Diallo Fraser, I'm sorry, not Amadou Diallo, Diallo Fraser. I'm sorry, Diallo Fraser. Okay. He's written a couple of books. I have one of them. It's called The Dow of uh, 52, which is an excellent book, which Ryan gave me for my birthday a few years back. Oh, wow. Yeah. Right. So his, his name is uh, Diallo Fraser, and he's he's good too. In my Dennis opinion. Newsom, I guess. Uh, Norman's mentioning books with Dennis Newsom d demonstrating Jailhouse Rock. Yeah. yeah. That was nice of Ryan. And uh, we got, uh, no, okay, here we go. Here's another, okay. Uh, this is from Norman. Knocking and kicking comes from the Gula people from the islands of the correct uh, court, South Carolina, off the yep. coast of South Carolina. Got yes. it. Okay. Yeah, the Gullah. Nice. Thank you, Norman. Um, okay, my name Musgrave is the African Panatukan Filipino boxing. Okay, all right. Uh, what else? What else? I'm just going to get caught up here. All right, here we go. There's another question. All right, I'm glad I did this. I missed a couple questions. This is from Adam. Is there any truth that Professor V taught students Kali and Jiu Jitsu, and when it, they went into the prison, they developed even, even more? That's from Adam. That I don't know. I'm not too sure. I know that Moses Powell, who was his top student. Moses oh. Right. He taught a lot of ex-felons and helped, you know, <laughs> troubled youth, people that were in gangs and stuff like that uh, here in New York, Atlanta and Miami. And okay. so that I know of uh, in terms of developing even further the prison system. I've never heard that. I've never heard that. OK. OK. All right. Uh, let's get into razors. So uh, razors coming from the prisons and into the lovely streets. So that's... <laughs> well, the straight edge razor was something that was carried back in the old days by pimps. 
and uh, the straight edge razor, you know, with open and f open and close. Mm -hmm. And it's a defensive weapon, but very adept and very skillful and very quick with it. The razor system and the prison system, I, I could speak for Rikers Island here in New York City. Um, six days that I was there, when my mother bailed me out, I actually saw a guy walking around with a Gillette in his mouth. And some guys that I had talked to when I was in the system upstate saying that they got that from uh, Pam Greer, who played a prostitute in the movie Fort Apache in the Bronx. There was a scene in there where she had a razor in her mouth and she cut this guy to death. And then she had cut another guy and eventually she got stabbed to death in the movie. Pam well, Greer. Yeah, Pam Greer. Yeah, she had the razor in her mouth. That was the first time I saw that as a kid when I saw that movie with Paul Newman and uh, uh, what's the other guy's name? Uh, they used to play in the um, Wise Guy series, man. He was also in the Wanderers movie. Can't remember. Ken Wall. Okay. Right. Pam Greer is. Uh, yeah. Pam yeah. Greer. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, that adapted. I tried it at one time one or two in my mouth and I kind of like cut myself inside it because you yeah, have to I, uh, this guy's not putting a razor in his mouth I'm just saying just me I'm not yeah. saying you can do it but this guy is not putting a razor in his mouth no I'm not. <laughs> and I said no, it's not for me yeah. but basically uh that was the tool inside the prison system outside of uh, ice pick shanks different types of uh, improvised uh as weapons that they were used to real quickly you know spit out and uh cut you mostly you know you're going for the face and that yeah. buck 50, which basically after you got your face sliced, man, and it opened, they had to stitch it up with 150 stitches. So that's where that term came from. That's where that uh, buck 50 references. Interesting. Okay. I always heard that, but I could be honest with you, could never tell you why it was named buck 50. Yeah. Nice. I saw my Dean uh, when I was in Job Corps, man. He was a nice guy, too. His name was John, I think. And he, had, he did maybe like 16 months on Rikers Island, and he had a a big slash on his face and i saw him carry like three gillette razors in his mouth and spit them all at once and then put them back in his mouth again that's how fast think, he was. think about that like the practice that you got to do and to be like that smooth where you're not cutting yourself and uh, uh, that is like training on a whole different <laughs> Guy that mentioned about the Gullahs and the Geechees in South Carolina, a lot of those guys that came up to the north and were hustlers and pimps and you know drug dealers and racketeers and stuff like that, you know, beside carrying a you know twenty five or whatever, twenty two, and back in them days, they would also carry straight as razor because they were very skillful and very adept with it, and uh, very good. It's, it was known for any gutcho Gullah man, Geechee Gullah Geechee man, to carry a straight as razor just. It was just like part of the, the, the culture or the street, you know, they would carry it, you know. And there's certain stereotypes that are put out there, certain ethnic groups that do have some weight to it that you can see that like, yeah, such and such person, they're known for this. Like for instance, back in the days during the gang eras, 50s, 40s, 50s and 60s, Italians were known for uh, the baseball bat or the old stiletto knife, the old timers. The old stiletto knife. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And the Puerto yeah. Ricans are known just for carrying a knife. You know what I mean? The old Hibaro countryside, you know, guys from the country, the, the farmers, the people that came from the countryside that came to the city, where well, they were used to fighting with machetes and with blades and stuff like that, what they learned from the Spanish influence mm. with, and with the African or the Taino culture as well, known for that. And then, you know, it's just different groups, different ethnic groups, man, were known for carrying certain tools and weapons to combat each other in the streets before the gunplay really got serious in the streets. Yeah, it, I tell you, it's, it's, it is fascinating. Um, it's when fascinating. you look at like the yeah. cultural influence and all that, and uh, ice I'm just not, yeah, I mean, ice, I'm, ice picks. Yeah, all right. I'm just making, just, I'm just want to make sure I'm just not missing any other questions. Uh, 25, <laughs> a 25 cent razor is an absolute menace. That's from Ryan. Yeah, I can't disagree. All right, this is from Carlos. I worked at the Tombs and at Rutgers Island. Inmates used to conceal blades in their throats to get through security. Are yep. people using that in attacks anywhere? Conceal in their throats. Wow. And you know what? I know something else, Dean. Also in their rectum, too. Yeah, I've heard the... I was gonna bring that up, but I did. Uh, I did hear that. Yeah, 
but in their throat and gagging it, man. That's yeah, again, that's a whole man. That's a, that brings a whole new level to attribute development. Man. Yeah. <laughs> oh, jeez, man. Um, uh, Dean, I don't, I don't mind. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh no, go ahead. I'm just going through comments. Go ahead. Video, if they really want to know about that prison culture with the razor and everything, there's a video you can go on YouTube. It's called Scarface for Life. It was a video. Scarface for Life. Scarface. Scarfaces for Life. It was done by a guy named Troy Reed out of Harlem, and it came out, I think, the video in 04. And okay. you can watch that on YouTube, and you can see the whole video. And, you know, he interviews a lot of guys that were inmates in the system and all the stuff that we're talking about now. You know what? Somebody just mentioned this. A great film on Razor's Scarf and Mike Raymond, and Ryan just also substantiated. Okay, so folks, uh, sounds like that's something to check out. Scar Face for Life on, and that's YouTube again, correct? Okay, there uh, in Capoeira Angola, there is a Razor system. Yes, that oh, is interesting. That is true. And Michelle. And, and, I know three. Wow, Ryan knows three buck fifty <laughs> victims. Jesus. Uh, at, okay, here we go. Here's a question. Ask Alberto to speak on the ease of purchasing knives like double double seven knife and switchblades back in old New York. That's from Ryan. The 007 knife, I remember seeing it in the late 70s. It was a knife that you could easily purchase in any hardware store, maybe even mm -hmm. a bodega. It had a long wooden handle, right? That said 007 on the side. It was a brown wooden handle, and it had like I a never heard that. No kidding. Really? And it was, a, yeah, yo, Dean, it was a long blade, and it was pointy and sharp. You could buy a 007. I bought my first 007, only uh, 007, I think in 85 for like 10 bucks in a hardware store. So you could just go in there, any any double seven, any the Bond movies, or just they just called the double seven. Yeah, that was just the name they gave it, and they stopped mass producing it. I think you might be able to buy them online, but that was a knife that it was used a lot in the streets, uh, a lot of stabbings. Double o seven, a long knife you could just go in anywhere, pick up for ten bucks or whatever. Wow. The the stiletto, I have a, a stiletto. It's a flipper I bought on Amazon. It's got a wooden handle, surgical steel. But I don't carry it on me because it's illegal, because it's a gravity knife. And then the blade is over uh, four inches. Over four inches, yeah. There's a good book that uh, I think it's uh, very educational on the stiletto Sicilian <laughs> knife fighting by a guy named Vito Quattrochi. He's out of uh, Hoboken, New Jersey. And he's a, a Sicilian-American descent and has studied with the masters of Sicily and learned from back in the days. Because that was a knife that was particularly carried by uh, Sicilians. And it's based, a lot of it is based on the uh, thrust, I mean, the uh, fencing system principle, where it's more thrust than it is slashes. Which, go back to thrust, I mean, look at the prison system, thrust, you know what I mean? It's like a it's like a repeating thing, you know what I mean? And this, what, I'm sorry, because I've always been interested in the Sicilian rate and all that. What, what was the gentleman's name again? Vito Quattrochi. Quattrochi in Sicilian means four eyeballs, like eye to eye. Quattro, yeah, Quattro. Wow. Quattro, yeah. He's a part. That's just what though. Wow. I got to check that out. His, his uh, book was actually published by uh, Paladin Press. You remember Paladin Press? Oh uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And what was the book's name again? Uh, Sicilian Knife Fighting by Vito Quattrochi. Sicilian Knife Fighting. I gotta check. Yeah, Knife Fighting. I gotta check this out. Yeah, I've always, you know, it's one of those things that's I've heard about before, and I uh, always wanted to check out. But then, of course, something else comes up. I kind of forget about it and then you know one of those deals uh okay another question just all right um okay from adam is there grappling or anti-grappling in 52 blocks i know there's sweeps trips takedowns like double uh leg takedowns or what they call the pant flip where you you know you go down for a double leg and then you pull the pants from the uh from the bottom okay and then take a sweep up your opponent and just stomp on them. Um, that's that's the only. There, there is a few grappling moves, but it's it's mostly it's mostly a lot of hands, elbows, wrists, a lot of blocks. You know what I mean? Deflections, parries, 
uh, it's very evasive and it's very, uh, like you said, um, what's, the, what's the word that I can best describe? I think you described it earlier. You know, it's, it's very, it's, it's like magic, man. You know what I mean? It's like to confuse the enemy, man, and just throw him. Yeah, distract. Yeah, distracting. Like you do that, then you go down to oh, like pick this pants up. Like for instance, they ain't playing a guard game on a prison floor, <laughs> or even on the street. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, anti got it, got it. Uh, okay, here's another one. Have you observed or heard of the difference between East Coast versus West Coast gang related street weapon use? Um, I can uh, give a little on that just by working with my pal on this project. Um, but you go ahead. Uh, the West Coast, well, I have relatives in LA, the West Coast is mostly uh, with the gangs. A lot of drive-bys, you know, automatic weapons. I mean, even like in Folsom, San Quentin, Pelican Bay, you know, Chino, and some of these rough prisons, man. You know, they, they definitely have a system in there, and it's mostly a lot of knifings. But they also have, I guess, like the close quarter combat, you know, system of prison uh, boxing or dirty, dirty boxing in the prison mm. system. But the gangs, like in New York, also, you know, there's a lot of gunplay, but there's also a lot of knife play. Like I was telling you yesterday, I believe. Right now, there's a lot of, like a real high percentage of crime with edge weaponry where people are just getting stabbed repeatedly. You know? Yeah, it's, um, it's making a comeback. Yeah, um, they all told yeah. me that years ago it was going to come back. No, and I think it has. I mean, not just here, but you look in Europe, like we 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 spoke yes. on. I mean, it's yeah, um, London. Yeah, London. Italy. I mean, like for instance, I'm doing this project with my pal, and there is kind of. It, I don't know if it's an actual system or tactics, you know what I mean? Like, for instance, you know, I, I love this, you know, but it's the Folsom, you know what I mean? And uh, matter of fact, I just got the book, and of course, I can't find what, it right Don now. Pentecost? Don Pentecost? Yes. Yeah, the yes. Folsom. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And so, um, but um, let me just make sure. Okay. <laughs> The book is called The Sicilian. Okay, thank you, Michael. And um, oh, Norman, I if I can't find it, I would really much appreciate that, Norman. Yeah, it's something I always want to look into, and and it always piqued my interest. Okay, uh, no, pairing a knife or cutters have been my experience. Pairing knives, okay, should specify edge weapon impact differences rock and roll is the la street prison style okay thank you yeah. ryan heard of rock and yeah roll. definitely look back at grand central christmas day oh, i know you hear that the, what, what happened there oh what in the grand central here in new york yeah i guess there was yeah there's a lot of problems on now because of that whole yeah, world unfortunately i guess yeah um so yeah let's go into that the whole like yeah knife i mean kind of making uh unfortunately a comeback and uh, i think you know um i think obviously easy to buy purchase cheap significantly cheaper than a handgun we're looking at several i mean the economy i think there's a bunch of factors that are attributing to this um yeah. increase um just lawlessness, uh, ethical, uh, morals, compass, I think is taking a downturn, yeah. uh, unfortunately. I mean, what say you? Well, you know, it's the same same thing like we spoke uh, previously, uh, the economy. Now we're in like post-pandemic and you see the last three or four years how crime has risen tremendously. Uh, people are just leaving places like New York, Chicago, LA, California, there's like a, a, a a great migration where people are just close to about almost a million people in the last Look couple of like San Francisco's a mess. It's a mess. <laughs> okay, even San Diego, man, it's, it's just a mess. It's out like there. God Almighty. <laughs> yeah, bad, bad. And, you know, Professor James Hunden, who's a very good friend of mine, who was Wally J's, actually, besides Leon J, Professor James Hunden was born and raised in San Francisco, and he uh, has his own system of small circle jujitsu that he learned from the late Professor uh, Wally J. Mm -hmm. Trap boxing, which is a combination of what he learned on the Vunak as a full instructor, what he learned on the Wally J and mm -hmm. Supreme, you know, a hybrid system. And we talk from time to time. He's he lived here in New York for about eight or nine years, and he loved it. But then he went back to San Francisco. Uh, he trained with uh, mm -hmm. Little John Davis and uh, Robert Crossan, and both of them were students of Moses Powell and Professor V. And uh, we talk from time to time, and uh, we talk about these same issues: how the economy is bad and 
you know, and now you have like pro gun rights and then pro Republican conservative versus the left. We have the anarchists like the Antifas and all of them, you know, there's a lot of racial tension, a lot of stuff going on, man. And so like, you know, you were saying, you know, bad times like this, eventually we'll be able to get over the hoop. We'll produce better times later on because we've been through it before. I hope so. You know, and I hope so too. (laughs) Because I tell you, I've never just seen, you know, and not to digress here, but I just never (laughs) seen like some of the stuff we're seeing today, hearing and just, the divide and the and the, the the extremity of like the right and the left. Not I'm not talking about like what used to be 20 years ago where they could actually work together. Right. I'm just seeing like this polar opposite and what Absolutely. it's doing to this country. You know. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah, it's I don't know, it's not good. But I, much to your point, I truly hope there are better times ahead. Let me just see if I'm missing any questions. Knows offices. He's a West Coast instructor in 52 blocks. Maybe if you're into 50 blocks theme, he is a Lameco guy too. All right, all right. Uh, this is why systems like Medusa. Yes, uh, absolutely, Ryan. This is why systems like Medusa are important to to look into. Same with. Um... Oh, he gave me a shout out. Who's that? Ryan. Hey, Same Ryan, with what's up, man? and Blade Tech as well. Thank you, Ryan. Right. That's very, very kind of you. I, I I didn't send the check out though yet, Ryan. But I'll, put the, I'll make sure the check goes in the mail tomorrow. Um, John, uh, GA, not do okay. GA not prosecuting. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, there's certainly uh, folks getting away with things that perhaps some time ago they wouldn't get away with. Awesome, folk being shared. Keep. We can look upcoming. Thank you, sir. Keep the books. We can, you know. Okay, Tony, um, to be a guy on the avenue in Thompson Square Park, they used to do the 52 blocks are still does, but his name escapes me. Okay. Light Burley. Find out his name, Tony. Um, Light Burley. Uh, Tony, is that it? Yeah, Light Burley. Light Burley, okay. Mike Burley. And he's still really active, huh? And he's. Uh, Light Burley was active for a long time. He started doing seminars, and uh, I think he even went as far as the UK. He's got students out there, and oh, he was wow. doing training in Thompson Square Park. But uh, he's kind of like I don't know, faded out a little bit, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Lini. Okay, just might be okay. Okay. Um, so what do you? Okay, so uh, now that we kind of went into all that deep dark and all that, mm-hmm. you're doing. Uh, the, the Irish stick, man. You got those big. <laughs> That's my walking stick until I get my cane, man. I, I carry the, the bata. Well, I got to ask you, though. I got to ask you, bro. When you do the walk, man, you got with that Irish stick, man, you got that pimp shuffle going. On. I try, man. I try, but my knees sometimes won't let me, man. <laughs> so, due to the knees, you're not doing any pimp shuffling. I'm not doing any pimp shuffling, man. No. <laughs> but see, you're on. You could have lied. You could have said, you, you know. You could, you I don't know. Lied, I get but you get... man. I'm a right winger, man. You know what I mean? It's it's it's. I'm a Republican, man. So I try to stay as conservative as possible. Yes, we gotta <laughs> we gotta get this country back, man. That's all I'm gonna say. That's all we gonna, to. I'm gonna leave it at that because I don't want to get there you go politically attacked here. There you go, man. And, I know we got to God help us. God help us in 224. Oh, <laughs> That's all good. I'm not going to say anymore. That's it. Um, but uh, so, all right. So what what, did, what do you like about the Irish stick? What are you know, here, man, you're going from knife, this and that. And now you're kind of the shillelagh. And uh, so yeah, what, uh, I, I was I was watching the videos, man, and I was impressed with it. And then I saw somewhere in the Internet, I guess, through meetup was a young gentleman from the East Village. He's originally from. Uh, Buffalo, okay. and uh, he's not a he's not a coach or an instructor yet, yeah. but he started a group to meet up. We used to meet uh, we used to meet in Thompson Square Park. I started with him in May. Now we're meeting up in Washington Square Park in the in the West Village, and uh, my curiosity just 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 took me there, man. Uh, there's a good brother that I know named Carlos Alejandro, and I know he's watching now. He's a former Kaioka Shinkai uh, uh, fighter and uh, he also trained with me with Jeff. Uh, mm. I 
Another guy named Rav Grasso out in Queens was a retired cop in the Dos Manos, the screamer system, using the two two hand, you know, with the staff. Okay, yeah. And uh, then, you know, I, I I said, wow, I saw a picture of Carlos, man, and I said, you know what, I got to come down and met up. And um, our, our our teacher Mike, he gave me the the wooden stick that I walk with now, and I saw the it's practicality of it. You know, it's not a lot of marshmallow fluff, and it's not a lot of fancy this and that, and mm -hmm. Footwork is, is is pretty pretty simple because you know I, my my background in terms of my footwork that helped me in Dog Brothers martial arts was uh, coming from boxing and uh, then Piketty Tertia. Mm. Uh, but uh, you know the the the, uh, the Irish stick fighting footwork is 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 very similar to 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 the boxing, but it's a little bit different. You know what I mean because of the terrain that they had to fight. You know in the countryside in the mud and stuff like that, and they have what they call the hair which is a rabbit type of uh, motion with the feet maneuvers. And so the blocks, the parries, the strikes, to me was very practical. And I found a really mm -hmm. interesting simplicity of it because what you really need in any system, empty hand or with weapons, impact edge weapons, grappling, whatever, is, uh, the, you know, be simple and direct. You know, just like Bruce Lee, the simplicity to direct, the effectiveness of it, you know, add, mm -hmm. discard what is useless, add that which is specifically your own. Et cetera, et cetera, and I believe in that concept and that philosophy. Uh, you know, so it's, um, yeah, it's you know, it's interesting. What I found more interesting was the history of the the uh, whiskey distilleries fighting one another. Like yeah. the history of it, to me, I, I thought it was really really interesting. Um, you know, how you would have these guys just meeting in a field or whatever, and just going at it over whiskey. You know? <laughs> Movie gangs in New York in the beginning, which I was watching earlier today, I think yesterday, when they first had that big, big brawl between mm -hmm. the different things and the five points, which, by the way, that movie wasn't even filmed in the U.S. It was filmed in Italy. Um, one of the no guys, kidding. yeah, it was filmed in Italy. Yeah, yeah, it was filmed in Italy. One of the guys that was one that had eventually became uh, like, I guess, one of the chief guys that eventually was put into the politics in Tammany Hall, whatever. They mm -hmm. showed him in the movie with a chalet because you could see the knob on top and on it. He had yeah. a knob of all the people that he killed with that stick. And then he went in there and was just swinging. And you could see all the strikes that he did. Like if he hit the the, the leg by the ankles, man, the, 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 the whole ankle, the whole leg would just buckle. Like, you know, he just went right through it. He just cracked right through it. Yeah, and, that knob uh, coming through. And then you got the burrs on the stick. And yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's, that's not a good day. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm just making sure I'm just caught up here. Uh, da, 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 da. I think some of the times he used it with the 52 blocks, mixing some Wing Chun. Okay, uh, he's mostly boxing now, like Burley. Oh, so I guess Burley's mostly doing boxing now. Okay. Yeah, he's doing mostly boxing now. Yeah, that's what he's doing. He's okay. doing oh, we got GM Ray Floral from Australia saying hi. And Ryan is hundred percent. All right. Um, so you're. Um, so is that what you're kind of actively doing now? For the most part, is the Irish stick and that some, is okay. And the Wing Chun you mentioned. Yeah, that and Wing Chun. Yeah, that's not a bad combo. I mean, I could kind of see you're in here and <laughs> just take horizontal and turn it yeah. vertical. All right. <laughs> the Wing Chun is like my Tai Chi, you know. <laughs> Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Um, so what do you, okay. So far as like, uh, future and lands, like what, you know, if you could like, what do you think you'd like to dive into or train into, you know, um, assuming time knees get better. What else do you think you'd like to do? Well, in the meantime, because of uh, my knees, um, I'm just going to stick with those two systems from now, but I will continue with the uh fma but more of the blade concept more than anything else yeah same here yeah that yeah i i totally agree i mean that's what i'm gonna see out there i i mean i i think the stick is neat and all that and I, but i've definitely gone much more into the, yeah, the blade the side. yeah yeah for sure you know um yeah no argument here uh for sure so uh well with that being mentioned the FMA, you going want to go more towards the blade side, like any systems of interest that you would like to check out or um, experience? Of course. Well, well uh, Pikiti, Pikiti Tertia. Um, I did, uh, I was at a seminar uh, December 10th in Long Island where, uh, at, what's his name? Eduardo Ceniza's one of his top students out of Cincinnati, 
did a two-day seminar here in New York, one in Manhattan and one in Long Island, on the uh, Ademis de Diablo or the uh, Barusok Boot. And uh, Barusok Boot, to me, I learned some of the basics in that seminar, but the videos that I've seen, and I think he's going to sponsor for uh, Master Sinisa to come to the United States in April. Mm. Uh, I see a lot of practicality and um, usefulness in that because it's really nice and empty hand. Yeah. And it's not like Sayak or Kikiti or some of these other blaze systems. No, it's, I saw a heavy dose of two on one, um, which, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, I, I I remember re I remember seeing the flyers for that, and that that was actually that was like really recent, right? Yeah, it was like that was on the tenth, so that was basically like three weeks. Yeah, ago. okay, right, yeah, yeah, um, and that was that was actually the first Barusa Bu uh, seminar in the United States. I know City. he's got a couple reps here doing stuff, but okay, all right, yeah, nice, nice, and uh, oh, a question came in. Okay, this is from Adam. When you compare Irish stick and FMA, would you say FMA is too complicated? Oh, good question. Uh, I actually I commend Adam for uh, bringing this up. Irish stick is gross motor skills, so possibly more practical. Huh. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. I agree the only with that. thing I think I would only comment may. Um, I think mo a lot of these FMA stick fine arts do overcomplicate things and all that. But I think if you look at the Mako, you look at um, Dog Brothers material, I think it's significantly less on that. Yeah, and I think it's definitely, obviously, the Dog Brothers are, can't argue they're not practical. Um, but I could definitely see why Adam would ask this question. Yeah. About uh, about uh, the Irish stick fighting and uh, uh, FMA versus FMA, and, and generally speaking, you know, where like you look at some of these systems, and mm -hmm. you know, I one could argue over codified. Um, you know, I agree with that. I can concur. With yeah, that. Ray uh, GM Raven Floor. I try not to. Yeah, you definitely have achieved that. And we got Renee um, is here, uh, who's also a a dog brother. Um, so, uh, so besides Bikini, what other systems do you think, if you had the opportunity, that you would maybe want to try out? But also both. On East Diablo. What about uh, so you ever uh, ever Ki? Um, Bilstrisimo, Kali, Cisimo, Kali, Cisimo. <laughs> yeah, I, I like. I'm just kidding. I'm just trying. No, no, no. no I'm glad you brought that up because you know, me and you, we talked about Romo, and I, I spoke to you Romo, Romo live on video like two, three times, and he was telling me a lot of things. Man, it's like we've always known each other. The conversation that we had. Yeah, you get on the phone, man. Yeah, man. <laughs> you be great, man. I, I, I like. I like. Him. Yeah. Good luck getting off anytime soon. You better. You better block off like uh, you know a good chunk yeah. of time. <laughs> yeah. Definitely, yeah. But how can you not love Yuli? Yeah. Um, the Laban Laurel and Lameco is much better drilling system than others. Yeah, I think that's fair, Norman. Okay, Rene Karbikovang, far as a stick. Okay, I did forget that. Um, okay, oh, Tony's asking, when do you guys get together in Washington Square Park? Sounds very interesting. We used to get together on Sundays from 10, 15 to, well, I want to say 11, 30. But I think, because it was canceled last week because his son got sick, but we're supposed to be getting together Saturday uh, in Washington Square Park at the same time at 10, 15. And you could just go on Meetup and just type in New York City uh, Irish stick fighting mm. and just, uh, you know, register there and then just come down, man, you know? Oh, wow. Well. And you guys are doing outside, right? Uh, yes. Until yeah. when the Weather's going to get cold, so we're going to have to find an indoor location where we're going to have to rent it out, yeah. But for now, you guys are outside, okay. I mean, December's been, knock on wood, it's been pretty mild this year, man, uh, you know? Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, man. Wow, this has been awesome, man. I, you know, this has been historical, kind of educational and all that. I mean, any 
final thoughts to the viewers or anything that you would like to say or as far as well we I, 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 I want to thank you dean for having me on i want to thank oh, you yeah. thank my associates and friends my martial arts brothers that are watching this right now um just keep training 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 and uh you know health is wealth movement is medicine so you know keep that body going you know and um just don't look back man just keep going just keep going no, forward no, you're absolutely right oh, man dude. yeah i mean i can teach but me I'm, I'm like a student teacher man i'm 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 just I'm just just like i'm always going to be a disciple for some reason i don't know yeah i don't think there's anything wrong with that i mean the i i consider myself uh the you know the forever student i think that's a healthy outlook to have you know what i mean once you stop learning i think they're I think that the death be, starts to begin you know, on your journey because you're not out there seeking anything new, you know. And a lot of the fights that I've had in the past when I was younger, even till recently, like a couple months ago, man, it was always empty hand, man. And what really like saved my butt in the street was boxing and judo, man. More Thank boxing. You. Good boxing, some decent footwork, some anti-grappling wrestling stuff. Ooh, I mean, it? right? I mean, that's it's not overcomplicated, you know what I mean? Um, let me see. I'm just catching up on the comments. There is an Australian stick fighting system as well. Pond snake. Uh huh. I'm not familiar with that. Huh. Renee, definitely if you know anybody that's doing that, let me know. I like the that might be an interesting interview. Craig Rushworth is a black belt in that system. Ah, okay. I know Craig. And yeah. what? Yeah, the system he's mentioning from um, Australia there. But I know Craig really well, so I'm going to have to talk to Craig. Oh, huh. Boxing is best for empty hands. Yeah, no argument, Norman. Western yeah. boxing, yeah, I don't think anybody would dispute that or shouldn't dispute that. Oh. Yeah, movement is medicine, Ryan. Absolutely. Got to keep moving, man. You, use it or lose it, right? Right. Use it or lose it. Oh, here we go. Interesting in how you have adopted these systems for someone that has limited mobility, bad knees, right? I mean, but, you know, good on you for keep doing things. I mean, you could have just said, hey, you know what? I'm throwing a towel, man. I'm done, you know. I mean, you look at it like this, 25 plus years between construction work and security. I did a lot of heavy construction, especially in the masonry and labor field and concrete and all that. And then security for almost 15 years. I mean, I've, I've been around a lot of important people from like Colin Powell to Hillary Clinton and working right next to the Secret Service to like artists and entertainers, Stevie Wonder. I mean, you, you name it. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, with uh, the training the last 16 years is just wear and tear. But I always said to myself, this is what's going to keep me alive. And like what Chief Grandmaster Rico Guy taught me, who, who was a combat veteran in Vietnam, who was a street fighter and everything. He said, if you continue doing martial arts, this will take you anywhere in the world, man. And he was right. He was right. That's you know what that's profound. Like if you could tell, take it wow. And because he's he, he at that time, you know, he traveled to Europe, Japan, all over. He did seminars, and you know, this was his experience, his expression. And I to this day, even though he's passed almost four years, I still have a lot of love and reverence and respect for him because a lot of the time that we spent together and a lot of mm -hmm. things that I learned from him and what he taught me about life and just just life in general and about com fighting and combatives and this this and that. That'll never leave me. That'll always be in me. It's like a seed that he planted in me and, and others, and it, it will never go away. No, I mean, that's, but, you know, more than thinking about what you just said, his statement there, it's not only profound, but it's, there's actually truth to it. You know what I mean? So, well, well that was, man, sounds like an exceptional guy that, you, you know? Yep. Yeah. Wow. Well, hey, well, hey, it was a pleasure to have you on. Happy to do it. We, got, we have to thank Ryan. Ryan did. Yeah, definitely. Did. Thank Ryan. Definitely. Did. You know, I recommend you and all that. We just got to watch out for Ryan, though, man. I don't know. He's a little shady, man. I don't know. That Ryan guy, man. <laughs> he's, a, he's he's definitely a wanderer and a nomad and, and a Bedouin, just like me, a vagabond, man. We just keep trying. <laughs> he's uh, <laughs> He's okay. I appreciate what you're doing, still training. Yeah, absolutely. You gotta keep moving, right? Same with you, Norman. You gotta keep doing it. Keep doing it, Norman. And actually, Norman, we need to uh, meet. Um, need to see that level two stuff from you, uh, Ryan. Alberto is absolutely the real deal, Holyfield. All right. 
<laughs> uh, 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 yeah. Oh, well, hey, if I don't talk to you, I have the happiest of New Year. And you too. I'm sure our paths will cross now that we've got acquainted with Brian and what have you. And uh, sounds like we all need to get together it's in the near future, man. We, I mean, I, I got to start making this stuff happen, man. I don't know if it's true or not. Before we finish off, I heard that New Haven pizza is the best, not only in the United States, in the world. Is that true? I think so. And I'm so fortunate to live in Torrington, which really uh, close to Torrington, which they say is very close also to the New Haven. Uh, but New Haven, I mean, because you got Sally's, you got Peppy's. Everybody says Peppy's, Peppy's. I'm okay. going to tell you something. Sally's, man, right up there with Peppy's. But I'm going to have to I'm gonna have to get on that red line Metro North from Fordham Road, my former university, take the wife and go up there to New Haven and try Sally's. You're gonna, yeah, it's an experience. Matter of fact, there's a street there. So you got Peppy's, you got Sally's, you got a couple of other restaurants, and you got Italian bakery with all that. It's all on this one street. Oh. One street, one block. Yeah. Definitely, definitely, you want to do it if you can do it, man. Absolutely, man. That's yeah, cool. yeah. You will not be disappointed, but uh, yeah, New Haven is. Uh, I heard New Haven Beach is like old McDonald's. No, it's not. Oh, <laughs> that's blasphemous. Oh gosh, can I get oh, known? Can I? I mean, absolutely. Yeah, um, pizza. Yeah, everybody thinks. Oh, you know, New Jersey, New Haven. I, I was I was mind blown when a guy that born and raised in Connecticut his whole life a couple of years ago when the pandemic really hit hard, you know, he told me New Haven. I said, really? I'm thinking, oh my God, it's known. It's known. Bronx. I'm like, you know, it's like Brooklyn pizza to me in the five boroughs is the best. It's the sauce. The secret is in the sauce, not the yeah, cheese. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying there's not good pizza. In there. I mean, come on. Of course there is. But New of Haven course. is known. Known. I mean, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Gotta go you got to do it. If you can do it, you should really do it. Yeah. yeah Make it to that. You go there, check out Sally's. You got Peppy's. Um, yeah. Then you got the bakery. And it, yeah, definitely. Oh, definitely. <laughs> All right, my brother. Hey, well, uh, you take care, man. Thank you, man, Dean. Take care. Thank you very much, man. God bless. Absolutely. Same to you. I got you, yeah. All right, that wraps up 455. Who is next? Who is next? All right, let's check it out. Uh, a couple theme episodes coming up, actually. Uh, one, we're going to be doing a review of Molly Powell's latest books on the stick arts. If you have not gotten those, just incredible. Um, who else? I got to reach out to Don Cuesta. Uh, way overdue. Um, trying to get him on. In January, though, I've got to be a couple guys who are going to be doing demos episodes. Uh, Conrad. And I think Eugene, I believe. And who else? Also, we're going to be covering Finland, FMA. That's also coming up in Ju uh, January. I don't know why I was going to say July. Chris Nolly is supposed to get back to me. We've been trying to get him on, seems like, forever. Um, but, yeah. And so, also, uh, possibly Jason Schultz depending on the release of the new Medusa material, but we'll, we'll wait to hear from him on that. But yeah, so those are some, some of the stuff that's coming up. And the theme episode two, I don't know if it's going to be January, but February, and I'm throwing this out there who might be interested. Lineage, is it important? Is it critical? And maybe it is. So we're going to get both lens on. I'm going to get somebody that maybe it's not so critical in their lens into somebody who absolutely believes that lineage is very important. So if you know anybody that would be good for that, by all means, let me know. Um, hence, Renee is why I asked uh, on the Dog Brothers if they think lineage is very important uh, in there. But, uh, yeah, so that's what's coming up, folks. So, uh, again, as always, check FMA discussion. It All the feature interviews are pinned there. But, anyway, thank you for those who watched. Uh, Fascinating uh, episode on the history. Uh, love episodes of where I actually learn stuff. And so, neat, neat. And, uh, but if I don't talk to you guys, please, please have a wonderful and happy new year. And I will see you guys in the new year. Can't believe 2024 already, huh? All right, guys. Thank you.